Mike, turn your games down. Hi, we're there a movie episode of Games My Mom Found. I am Mike Hilberton, and who's feeling lucky today with me? Hey, everybody, it's Kenneth Sanity, and like the movie we're going to talk about, I, too, look amazing in total darkness. <laughs> <laughs> this is Joe Butler, and they call me Krispy Kreme, and you'll never guess why. <laughs> and I'm Bill Tucker from A Gamer Looks at 40 podcast, and I have to ask you just one question. Are you feeling litigious? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> <sighs> That was pretty good. It was. Not bad. I'll give myself a seven on that one. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and Ken, what are we here to talk about? Well, we are here to talk about a movie I never thought we'd be talking about on Games My Mob Found. We are talking about the winner of a Patreon poll, which you can join for as little as $1. See show note for details. Uh, we're talking about 1971's Dirty Harry, as directed by Don Siegel and starring Clint Eastwood. And boy, if there's ever been more of a dad movie that ever existed, I don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. This movie yeah. reminds me of my grandpa. He all used to be into stuff like this. And this is a neo noir action thriller film, I guess. You know, <laughs> I, I, I don't bristle at the neo noir. That's a term. Yeah. 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 I, okay. I don't. I don't hate it. It makes sense. It does have some noir tropes to it. I will say that, but they're modified for a modern audience. So yeah, yeah. Why not? I just brought it up because I made such a complaint in Dark City about noir, so I had to bring. It up. <laughs> oh, one more noir to torture you with. Apparently, yes. Wait until we get you some actual noir to feast upon. No, thank you. This was enough. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I could watch more of the series. I don't plan to, but I could. I've actually seen a few of these. Okay, so those are the other movies, right? Because I was like, it's really weird. There's like three other movies with Clint Eastwood holding a revolver. So yeah, I'm they're all is... part of the same move set. They're just none of them are called Dirty Harry. Yeah. Next, what is it? The The Gauntlet, Sudden Impact, and the Deadpool. Yes. Are those the other ones? Oh, so. uh, Magnum Force. Magnum oh, yeah. Force. Sorry, sorry. Magnum Force, the Enforcer, Sudden Impact, and then Deadpool. Yeah, Gauntlet was something different. Never Has mind. anybody seen any of those? I haven't. Uh, yes. I know Jim Carrey was in one of them. Oh, Holy shit. I've seen the second one for sure. And I can't remember if I've ever seen the third one. At least I think Jim Carrey was in one of them. Somebody weird was in one of the movies. And like Liam Neeson's first action role was in Deadpool. In the, the Deadpool. Oh, it was Jim Carrey was also in the Deadpool. Oh. And Charles Martinet, the voice of Mario. Hey. Uh, that's fucking strange, but all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the Deadpool is also the shortest of the Dirty Harry films. So maybe we should cover that at some point. <sighs> <laughs> maybe. <laughs> we'll see what y'all think of this one. So Indeed. who's ready for a plot breakdown? Sure. I am. You don't want to hear what I say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now I want you to pay all very close attention to this because it will come in handy later in the show. Inspector Dirty Harry Callahan is tough on crime. When a madman named Scorpio begins terrorizing San Francisco, promising to kill one person a day unless his demands are met, Callahan begins to hunt Scorpio to the ends of the city, sometimes having to resort to extra legal methods in order to take out Scorpio. Dirty Harry takes it upon himself to become a pariah, delusioned by the system he believed in, and wages a one-man war to take Scorpio down for good. Let's go. <laughs> Fantastic. I lo- Man, you do a damn good bus summary, sir. You really do. He really does. Oh, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed writing that one, and I wrote it that way for a very important reason that we'll talk about later in the show. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, I cannot wait for that. So what's everyone's, so I guess, I don't want to do Mike's job, but what's everyone's history with it? Well, I'll start. Um, I don't have one. I watched this for the first time ever today. I'm wow. surprised. I'm wow. surprised, too. <laughs> this is your pick, so why did you pick this? It goes back to a book called Cinema Speculation by Quentin Tarantino. He talked about this movie so glowingly that I was like, huh, <laughs> I have not seen it, I don't think. because. Dirty Harry is one of those things, you know, you know that, do you feel lucky punk? Yeah. Everybody knows that. But like, 
You also know the, the 44 Magnum is the most powerful handgun in the world. Blow your head clean off your shoulders. Like, so much of Dirty Harry is steeped in the pop culture. And much like the Blair Witch that we covered before, hmm. I realized I knew a lot about it, but I'd never actually seen it. So that's why I wanted to make sure it got on the survey. Well, well, the other famous a- line that a revolver holds six shots enough to kill anything that walks. Oh, sorry, <laughs> well, let's, let, let's also back up a little bit. Dirty Harry as a character is very much so seeped in popular culture. But the actual movie itself, it's really just that mini monologue. Like nobody else could. I bet you most people, if you say, what's Dirty Harry? They would say, oh, you feeling lucky, punk. They, they wouldn't, wouldn't be like, oh, dead 14 year old in holes and <laughs> yeah. snipers and Serpico. Like they, 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 whatever. Hey, is it Serpico? Scorpio. Uh, Scorpio, rather. Serpico is a different movie. A Scorpio and all that. No one would remember those things because let's be perfectly honest. They're not all that memorable. This, this is all, this is all Clint Eastwood all the time. Oh. There's a lot. I, I'm gonna I, before you before you react before you react. I am gonna say there's a lot. There are other things going on here, and there are some really good performances. I really like the the gentleman who plays the mayor. I like that actor a lot. But it's, it's there's uh there's a lot of things going on here. I, I I have seen this movie before. I am positive this was a Netflix DVD rental at some point. I'm thinking <laughs> Netflix dropped this DVD in my mailbox at some point when I was I don't know, in college or so. And I remember liking it fine, and I like it just fine now. This is, I will talk about it. I think this is a very important movie. I think this is a movie Agreed. fan's movie. Uh, I think the this pacing and the shot selection is fantastic. His aerial shots were revolutionary for the time, became a hallmark of the whole Dirty Harry thing. Lots of great things in this movie. I'm not sure if we're going beat by beat or not. I think we could. I have it's, no it's, idea. It's, sim- it's simple enough to do, but this is a movie I like just fine. So I had saw this years ago, probably 2004, 2005, let's say, because I, I got it from the library. I went through a phase where I was tra- I was just going to the library and renting movies that I or borrowing movies that I'd never seen that I was curious about, but I didn't want to actually go to Blockbuster and pay. So I'm like, all right. And I had picked I had picked this up. I watched it. I had actually seen at least two or three of them. I know one of them has a group of bad cops that are killing people, and they all wear all ride motorcycles and wear sunglasses. <laughs> I and, think that's Magnum Force. Okay, I've seen so I've seen two of them. I think that's it probably then. But this movie had stuck with me. I didn't remember a whole lot of this movie. I remembered the dead fourteen year old. I remembered the ending, how it went, how it played out. But that was really about it. But I remember liking this movie and talking highly about this movie over the years. And I was not a film buff at all in two thousand five. You guys know that. You know, I'm not someone that pays enough, te- you know, paid a lot of attention to movies. I just, I watched it, I enjoyed it, it was fine, and I hadn't seen it since until yesterday and today. It took me like three days. It took me two days to finish this. And Joe, so I'm about to say something that's probably going to piss Ken off. What you're telling me is that the American Magnum 44 revolver is the equivalent of the Japanese katana. You know what? Yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. do like, I do like my Magnum. Uh, <laughs> um, I've never seen this before either. The only the only thing I know from this movie is is the Are You Feeling Lucky Punk, and the the worst cut that I can say from it is basically the the scene in Scary Movie Two where he's like, "Did I just shoot five shots or three hundred and sixty two And the guy's like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" And he's like, "Well, do you feel lucky, punk? Do you?" And they'd have the big like wheelchair race, and they run into each other, play chicken. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Remember that? Yes, man. <laughs> I had forgot. I I forget. I see scary movie too. I watch it and then I forget I've seen it again. You and this has happened a lot. No, <laughs> very depressing. I, Indeed. I was also uh, high when I watched this, like I usually am. And all I can say is this movie had the reverse effect, where at there's a certain point that I will bring up where I had to pause the movie because I was so fucking angry. And but that has a lot to do with uh, the fact that I I like to ground myself in reality because I'm a huge anime fan. So I decided to watch propaganda shows like The Rookie and SVU and Criminal Minds. And reading a sociopath, psychopath, sociopath d- does a lot to a man's psyche. Yeah, I mean that's 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 very fair. I think we should also talk a bit about the director Don Siegel. Oh my he, God, Don Siegel! Good old <laughs> Don Siegel, the man who'll do anything. I <laughs> really he he's, he has done so much work in Hollywood. His filmography is rather extensive. He did he started out as a montage director in the yep. early days of movies, 
He directed the opening montage of uh, Casablanca, which is actually incredible. And that whole movie, of course, is incredible. That's like, I mean, I know I'm not breaking any ground by saying Casablanca is really, really good. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's but um, he started out as a montage director and then moved into just a working director. He was a director for hire, and he just made stuff. As a matter of fact, in his wiki page, it says, Siegel directed whatever material came his way, which means he was a working director. In this era of Hollywood, especially in the 50s and the 60s, directors were more churning them out for the studio as opposed to having these strong, strong voices. Now, mind you, they did, of course, but it was definitely more of a working profession than probably what you would think of now. And uh, Don Siegel was one of those. Uh, he was most famous for directing the Invasion of the Body Snatchers in 1956, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, he's, he's just a solid, good director. And he kind of fell into this genre a little bit once Dirty Harry came out. Sorry, I'm a 70s Body Snatchers fan. <laughs> 70s Body Snatchers is great. But the 50s one is great, too. Yeah. Like, that's the Body Snatchers remake that was done in the 90s, I think. That was good. Yeah, it's fine. Like, Body Snatch is just a story that doesn't get old. But uh, before Don Siegel actually uh, ventured out into directing, before that, but after the montage department, he did a lot of work in special effects, right, like yes. fight scenes and whatnot. Oh. And that is what helped him become one of the most prolific filmers of brutal violence <laughs> the world has ever seen. Not like Sam Peckinpah levels of like blood squibs exploding and chunks of steak bursting out of gunshot wounds. Like Sam Peckinpah was interesting, but weird guy. Don Siegel just there's always just something kind of about the way he shoots violence, and he's he's just he's so good. He's it's it's a very I don't like gritty is not quite the word I'm looking for, but grimy. Yeah, maybe is the right word I'm looking for. Everything he shoots has a very grimy feel to it. It's never glorified, and it's always kind of unpleasant, as it should be, because shooting somebody in the head and having a steak fly out is actually pretty unpleasant when you look at it <laughs> on its face. And, it, and and that's why he really kind of fell into that role, world of like that gritty drama, although he's done so a variety of different work. He has a fascinating career. You look at his filmography, and it is all over the shop. Yeah, but like um, he's done some yeah. Twilight Zone. Uh, a couple episodes of that. He did a movie called The Killers, which everybody should watch from 1964. Right after this, 1973's Charlie Varick, one of the best antihero movies ever, starring Walter Matthau as a criminal. And probably one of the biggest movies of his career, like one of the most well-known, 1979's Escape from Alcatraz. Oh, yeah. That's a good I'm, movie. I have seen I'm, that. I'm going to I'm going to go off like on a weird tangent. Uh, can name a random horror movie that's come out in the last year. OK, Tarot. Tarot. Yeah. OK, cool. That works. So one thing that I I, I would say now, honestly, it, it goes into like kind of kids and also probably showing them things that they should be at a certain age to watch. I feel like a lot of movies nowadays aren't as good as movies that we've had back then, which sounds awful. because That's not like an old man. But this movie, like we're talking about violence, is very different. Like you, you can't compare can name tarot to like the original friday the 13th a lot of people the original friday the 13th you know was really extremely violent in fact a lot of people didn't like that movie originally same mm-hmm. thing kind of with this like you you compare this to john wick john wick is some completely like hollywood fight so where this kind of shows like what kind of day and age was to for this situation to happen and it's still though an extremely well good movie you bring up a real good point because you know watching this now you're kind of like eh, but that's the desensitizing like Consider back in 1971 when this came out, there weren't a lot of serial killers. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. this one, like so many others, was based partially on the Zodiac case. What is what was Gacy late 70s? I, I don't know, know when this. Gacy was. I think Zodiac out. was 60s because this came out in 19, I want to say, what was it? It was 1971. So a like, Zodiac killer thing was in the 60s. Yeah, Zodiac killer 60s. Yeah. I think Gacy 70s. Late Gacy 70s, was 70s. Though. I should know this. And then Dahmer is what? Early 90s? Yeah. I Dahmer was 80s. Dahmer's 80s? 80s, oh. early 90s, because I remember hearing about Dahmer in elementary school. That's because mm. you didn't live that probably far away from it. I <laughs> didn't actually. I actually had friends that had interacted with him. Oh, he was. So, I, I, uh, I mean, it wasn't far from a school that right next to a high school. I know that. 
1978, he's arrested. Yeah, Gacy, Gacy was 72 to 78. So it was like right before this. Yeah, right after. This was 70. Right after, my bad. Yeah, the movie I forget that, that serial killers weren't as prolific as what they are now, like in real life and in our media. Like, I, yeah. I, it's something that I can't think about because it's just part of the world we live in now. Mm-hmm. And that's it's kind of the mindset you got to put yourself in when you watch a movie like this, because while the antics of Scorpio don't seem, you know, too mind bending to us who have been no. completely destroyed by watching worse horrible awful things happen to people on the news yeah like yeah. for free we don't even yeah. have to pay to go see it in the theater back in the 70s you didn't have this and scorpio must have been fucking terrifying oh yeah. totally totally and and you also bring up a good point about the time and place of this you cannot compare dirty harry to a john wick but you mm-hmm. can look at it from a technique standpoint and from through the lens of 1971 America, which was not good. No. Like, we were coming out of the 60s. Uh, hippie love was dying down. And the early 60s, the 60s, were, the 70s, and Mike's a history buff. I'm sure you know this, <laughs> was not great no. at all. And I, the depictions of, of that era, San Francisco, and just, yeesh, it's it's – it makes sense that vigilante movies, and this is one of the first ones that came out. There were vigilante movies before, but this really started the trend of the hard boiled, hard nosed cop taking action into his own hands. It didn't start the genre, but it's definitely popularized it in the cultural medium. And this was exactly the kind of movie that the 70s was going to create. Era or, an, or a, yeah, a decade where we didn't trust the police, where we, 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 wanted, we wanted other heroes to come in and save the day. And the this idea of again vigilantism was very attractive in in the in the seventies because the seventies was not a great time <laughs> in American yeah. history. Yeah. It, the Vietnam War and everything else. Yeah. yeah, there there was just so much going on, a lot of strife, a lot of struggle. So as a reaction, and I always think, and I've said this before, but you know, good art is a reflection of the time period it's in. As a reflection of what the seventies was like, I think this is very very apt and. Um, and again, this has some great work in it. I think this is actually a beautifully shot movie. I think the pacing is great. Again, is it the John Wick movie? Again, I recently watched this movie a couple weeks ago called Kill, which is this Indian is an Indian action movie that takes place on a train. And it is absolutely fantastic and wonderful. And if you like John Wick, you'll love this. It is great. But this, you know, that that movie, this makes that movie look, I'm sorry, that movie makes this movie look like a PG, PG movie. <laughs> but... Still, the tension is there. The characters are there. And even though it's just, you know, five shots from a revolver, you know, from a 44 Magnum, it still has an impact. So yeah, we'll talk about it as we go through it. But I think it's important to look at this from a cultural standpoint as well as a film standpoint. And not even just what was happening in the culture, but what's happening in the movie theaters as well. This movie is basically tailor-made for the World War II veterans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you're, about that. you're yes. older gentlemen who fought in the war, who are now seeing this country become something that they don't know what it is anymore. It's the same thing that every generation goes through with the youth coming up and youth culture starting to permeate popular culture. And they're not having any idea what to do. You could be like me and, you know, OK, so what does stupidity toilet mean? And do the research, do the work, understand what people are trying to say. Or you could lash out at a culture you don't understand, and you could become Harry Callahan, who is the hero to these people who are seeing their world change, and he's the one person pushing back against it. That's fair. And, I mean, also, I'm assuming police brutality wasn't nearly a thing as it is now, either back then. I mean, I'm sure it was there, but it wasn't as... Pub- well, oh, no, you have the not as visual. Well, yeah, I mean, not. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, there was definitely yeah. a lot of mistrust of the police at that yeah. era, yeah, and in California um, especially. They were still California. hitting people with phone books. Yeah, the, yeah. The, so yeah, because the way I think about it too is, I think when I think police brutality, I'm like, oh, a lot of that stuff happened in like what is it during the 70s? I you mean, know, when he had like the protests and everything. But then I remember, yes. oh yeah, too back then the police were seeing as the good guys because protesters were the bad people because they were doing stuff they weren't supposed to anyway. So protesters, yeah. yeah. Yeah, peaceful. The fact because oh, yeah, you get civil rights, what am I thinking? Yeah, so mm-hmm. and the fact this takes place in San Francisco too is very apt because of course that was a hotbed of all of this sort of 
strife and struggle and lots of freedoms and, and you people, you know, it's San Francisco in the late 60s or 70s. I mean, that's what that's what that era was. So I think it all kind of coalesces. And I think you make a really good point, Ken, in that this is this is definitely it's a, it's a, it's a, this is your dad's favorite movie. <laughs> right? is, and uh, and it's and there's a reason for that, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that that's probably also why it was a bank robbery when the early scenes of this movie. It's also all black guys that are robbing the bank, too. And I'm sure that wasn't by uh, mm-hmm. accident. <laughs> yeah, all uh, all black gentlemen in not quite, but almost Black Panther outfits. Yeah. Right. Oh, very oh, nice. Hat. I saw that, yep. too. Yeah. Yep. The, the, your, your lead uh, antagonist psychopath is a long haired hippie, you know, with the yeah. weird peace symbol that. belt buckle. And the, yeah. The, 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 the very much so the sort of person that, that Grandpa Tucker was probably like, I, I didn't understand. And honestly, not equipped to understand either. I, I try to give a little bit of mental grace to generations when I think about that sort of thing. Because it's easy to think back to me like how backwards it was. But were they really ready for the hippie culture? Were they, were they equipped to handle peace, love, and unity, you know, from 1950s, you know, no. pr- they they weren't equipped for that. Now that's not excusing their actions. That's not excusing the the reactions. But there has to be a little bit of grace for that. It's like, what did you what did you expect? <laughs> but um, this sort of fetish, fetishization of like, hey, let's take down the dirty hippie. That doesn't ring great now, obviously. So, which is why I think when you watch Dirty Harry, it's important to put yourself in that kind of cultural context. Where when you when they, when they when they do start firing out nasty racial epithets and not blink at it and just say, yeah, huh. Yeah, oh, God. When you these are the- words we use all the time. <laughs> I don't think we can get super. I, I'm I'm glad this exists because it, it starts a conversation. And when I, he's that's, in the police station, and the guy's oh. like, he hates everybody, and he just goes through and lists all the derogatory terms for all different races. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh. boy. Yeah. And again, so, we look at it now, and we, we say, oh, that's not that's not cool. But again, I again, I'm glad it's still preserved in such a way because it opens up that conversation. Yeah. That's yeah. how people openly talked in that day. And it's good that we don't openly talk that way. Now that is a good thing. We recoil at that. Yes, it, is. it shows progress. So we should be, we should be, we should be not okay with that. So real quick, two real things. Uh, actually, one you guys think, thank you guys for that. I could not figure out what the fuck that guy's belt buckle was. And do we get an official name for him? He's a Scorpio. We just heard him Scorpio. Yeah. That's what he uh, calls himself too. Yeah. Yep, yeah. just Scorpio. Oh. He's just Scorpio. Okay. That's He's got name. a real name that they release in the novelization. Oh, okay. Oh. That came out. <sighs> I think it it was something stupid. Okay, because the other like thing I was <laughs> Carl Davis or something like. Oh that. God. Because because the other thing that I I got from the <laughs> the other thing I got from the movie too from 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 this actor is I also kind of saw him as like not really being American because he has he has long hair and he wears that big stupid belt buckle but I always kind of felt like he was supposed to be like maybe Swedish or some kind of like European kind of guy my only one like reading that kind of weird no no for sure I could see no. that I didn't think about it but he also has you is introduced in the movie that he has no money that he's living at the the, the stadium that the guy lets him live at like yeah I think that's completely fair to have that assumption because it, it could have been what they were going for and that would fit the timing of this movie the 70s mm-hmm. yeah i'll take it indeed and uh b- b- before the bank robbery i do admit that the opening of this movie is great with the you know the officer is died in the line of duty and then like that complete like shot to the back to like a woman in a pool the the imposter shot oh man that is that is such a good opening oh really yeah incredibly good and scary and and freaking effective Right. I yeah, mean, it is unsuspected woman just taking a taking a dip maniac from the a, an, an expert sniper. Clearly, they don't get into his backstory, like where he was in the military or anything, but which you don't oh, need yeah. to. Not this kind of movie. There's no real you never get any backstory on the antagonist whatsoever. This is totally this is totally Clint Eastwood's, Clint Eastwood's jam and his journey. But uh, it's it's scary. I get that idea of, of a predator hunting from the shadows and just walking away. <laughs> That's I, that's pretty chilling stuff. I just had the worst fucking thought. I will put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> it must be a bad if you don't want to say it out loud. On this won't be this won't be said out loud. <laughs> All right. Well, I did some did a little bit a little bit of research. Uh, Scorpio's name is Charles Davis, which is so much better. So much better. But again, that's in the novelization. Not you know, it's not canon. Canon. Because <laughs> it's not in the movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, fair. 
I don't even want to put this in the chat because it's actually really fucking bad. <laughs> nope, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. It's fine. You can just, it can just live in your brain rent free. <laughs> there we go. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I can stay there. So, oh, boy, yeah. oh, boy. We're not going to ne- say that. We don't need the podcast to break up. <laughs> yeah. We really, we really don't. I'm not famous enough to have to worry about that. Yes. R.I.P. Yeah. Tenacious D. Yeah, R.I.P. Oh. Tenacious D. So I would have liked like, a little backstory of why he, I mean, I just took it as, you know, I never think about, but yeah, military training would make sense. I mean, there were so many people that came from Vietnam that then didn't know what to do and were just kind of lost. Like, all that stuff makes sense and fits that. So I also didn't question it. I was like, okay, he can shoot. All right. Well, you also, it's not like he's shooting running targets. I mean, the woman was just swimming. She wasn't exactly expecting anything. So. Well, the, the actor, Andrew Robinson, created his own backstory for Scorpio. Did he now? Yes, he did. It involved him being drafted to the Vietnam War, seeing the horrors being done in the name of the country, of course. When he returned home and saw how soldiers were being treated after fighting for their country, he, quote, went insane, end quote, and became Scorpio. Which makes perfect sense. And that plays the broken peace sign belt buckle in a really clever way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, like... I still had no idea that was a peace sign. I'm not going to lie. I saw that every time we showed that thing, I was like, what the fuck is that supposed to be? I thought it was like a person or something. Yeah, no, peace sign. I think this is a really good place to talk about Andrew Robinson. Yeah, let's do it. Go for it. Fuck, he's good. Yep, he is really good. Is that the guy that played Scorpio? Yep. Yep. Okay, yeah, he is. Don't you recognize him, Mike? No. How can you not? Where should I recognize him from? (laughs) It's Larry, the dad from Hellraiser. No. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I did not notice that. What's yeah. the age gap in that? Ten years? <laughs> oh, substantially more than that. Yeah, because this Hellraiser's late eighties. This is seventy one. Seventy one. Yeah. yeah, Andrew oh, yeah. Andrew Robinson. Like he did too well on this. <laughs> yeah, he did because he did. yeah, like yeah. everybody tried to typecast him as a villain after this. Oh, that's too bad. It really was like he from like 19, let's see, 1971. Then he did like a couple TV movies, an episode of Bonanza. He was also in Charlie Varick, another one of Don Siegel's films. But like just small little things like Marcus Welby, MD, the new Perry Mason, like episodes of television, not a whole lot of movies. And trying to get as far away from this as possible until, <laughs> well, not until like he did a lot of television work. He did some movie work. He was in a little movie called Cobra with Sylvester Stallone. I but that. 1987 is when he played Larry in Hellraiser. And he also got to play Larry, Larry's skin worn by Frank. And you, you, you could see Scorpio there. I mean, He's there. <laughs> it's a great job in here. Like I remember watching this in early 2000 and being like, okay, this is this is creepy and this is good acting and very believable villain. But I didn't even. I it wasn't until just our conversation where Bill had made comments about like, you know, serial killers weren't really a thing, so this would be more terrifying than to me. I'm like, okay, it's a sniper. I mean, we had that in Washington D.C. at one point. Like I, I remember how many years ago, but it happened within the in this millennium. Like there was the guys that just stuck their out of the ca- back of a car and shot people. Like and that. You know, that co- that goes to another thing, too, because he, he leaves the memo for the for police to find. Are we supposed to gather that he's also trying to cause a disturbance, too? Because he says he's going to specifically shoot very specific people, which is uh, people of color or was their priest. And yeah. then when, when you see him almost get caught, I I want to say I'm right. Ken will probably back me up. Was he aiming at what was supposed to be a gay black man? In that yes, first he part? was. Yes. 100%. Okay. That's what OK. Yeah. I mean, in San Francisco, that would all fit the 70s and everything that they're setting up hit that would have fit with the cult with the culture at the time watching this movie would have understood that without it saying it yeah mm, okay yeah i mean he was you know kind of flouncy he was wearing a purple poncho he was eating ice cream with another man <gasps> i'm pretty sure we can say probably gay yeah <laughs> especially for the 70s like that you know this yeah. is this is because this is like what 71 right yeah 71 so yeah that also very much fits what Hist- what people would have thought at that time, even more so. <sighs> if we can just go back to Andrew Robinson very quickly, sure. considering our audience and considering the fact that, let's be honest, a bunch of nerds out there, I'm sure, 
Uh, he, we cannot mention Andrew Robinson without talking about his turn in Star Trek Deep Space Nine as what was that? The creature Garrick. Yeah, Garrick. As Garrick. He was he was a very he was a main the Kardashian? character. Yeah. Yep. Oh my god. Yeah. He is Man. he is Garrick the uh, Kardashian. Yep. That's he and he played him in according to Wikipedia, thirty seven episodes. He was in so there for a while. Good. I'm just yeah. a tailor, sir. I'm not a spy who worked for the special forces. I'm just a tailor. Just the God, tailor. I love that guy. So we can't talk about his career without talking about his biggest TV work, which was in, and he's still Thanks. alive and still working. He, was, Thank he did a God. He did. If some, he ever he comes did, to a convention, I would get him to sign something with Garrick on it, just because. Yeah. yeah. He, 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 so just wanted to make sure we didn't didn't uh, finalize the Andrew Robinson conversation. I still kick myself. I had. I almost got to meet the reanimator guy. He was here for a convention, but I was in Boston when he was here, so I didn't get a chance to meet him, but I was 100% going to go meet him. Oh, I forgot the actor's name. but Jeffrey Combs. <laughs> yes. I didn't want to meet him because reanimator wanted to meet him because he also <laughs> is a Star Trek Key Space Nine. So. Well, he's, in, he's also played Edgar Allan Poe on stage for years. Like That's the other thing about Andrew Robinson. A lot of stage work. That's actually where Clint Eastwood scouted him from, uh, oh. from a production of Dostoevsky's The Idiot. Mm-hmm. He wanted Andrew Robinson to play Scorpio based off of catching him in a play. I think Very this is cool. also the first Clint Eastwood film we have done on the show, too. I Maybe. I'm pretty be right. sure, but I didn't want right. to bother to actually figure that out. Interesting. This is also, I think, the oldest movie we've done on the show, too. That may well be. But I don't really go back to the 70s. I don't really watch 70s films. And there was a lot of things on this that scream 70s. Like, there's one point when he's being a peeping Tom when he's trying to follow the briefcase. Because they, again, it's like this <laughs> is the 70s. They don't. Well, I want to. I, I want to get to what I'm trying. What I what I mean by that is like, yes, I, I know I started it wrong. But the idea, one thing I didn't think about is that they really don't have much information because it is the 70s. They just have Caucasian male carrying a, you know, this briefcase thing. Like, it's not like nowadays where they could pull up the internet and search this and search that. None of that's available to them. And like. Throughout this movie, they're like, oh, we got to get to the car and have somebody radio. To me, it's like, oh, you just call on your radio. Oh, yeah, we don't have that yet because that doesn't exist. And that was kind of a thrill watching this movie without having the technology that I'm that's so ingrained in our day to day life. This movie is, you know, 50 years old. Like, you know, it's kind of cool. And so people tell me, like, you know, he's doing research to see. Then he ends up getting beat up by a bunch of just random guys, which was I just find hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about those random guys real quick. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but. Harry kills some people in this movie. Oh, God, yes. And he messes with some people of various shades of skin. (laughs) But the four white guys who are literally beating the shit out of him, he's like, let him go. That's what I deserve. (laughs) That's messed up, man. That's not great. 71. And like the amount of nudity they have for no reason. Like you just see that woman, you just see her, you just see her boobs, like multiple scenes in this little part. And then like, Good just for no Tina. reason. Yeah, they call they call her hot Tina like everyone spies on her. So everyone yeah. fucking knows. Yeah, it was, you don't oh, want to have a nickname. Boyfriend. You don't want a nickname in the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> he was taking a he was taking a look at hot Tina hot Tina hot Tina. Awesome. I, I think that's great. I would love to know a hot Tina. <laughs> <sighs> you hear me, listeners. If you're out there and you go by hot Tina, find me. <laughs> He can be found between Illinois and Wisconsin. <laughs> I want to be your friend. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't really think about that, but you are right. Like he does kill multiple people in this movie, and yeah, it, he just shoots people. Like I do like the intro, one of the intro parts with Dirty Harry when he's talking with the mayor, and he's like, "Oh, don't!" And the guy's like, you "Don't have it. This is what you did that time in Fillmore." He's like, "I shot the guy for inciting rape." Like, how'd you know that? Well, he was running after. He was a naked man running after a woman with a giant knife and a and a hard on. I didn't think he was. Trying to talk or something like that. I forget what he says, but good line. Uh, that <laughs> was that know. was a great line. Great line <laughs> with a raging heart. <laughs> I think he said something like he wasn't trying to ask her a question. I think that's <laughs> something to that effect. There's lots of good lines in this one. Um, the portrayal of the of Dirty Harry as as the cop who's willing to do anything for justice. I I think the again we're we can talk a lot about vigilantism and you know, whether or not that's right or wrong. Um, depending on your personal worldview, you know, I have my own opinions on the matter. However, this movie really does glorify and make a case for someone to say, hey, you know what? Sometimes somebody's just got to go. <laughs> Sometimes 
You just gotta you gotta off a guy and not let the system bog down. And, and this movie celebrates that. That is, I I think the wrong thing to think. I think well, justice is important. It's the timing, I think. The year. Yeah, I mean, it's the timing in the year. And but I, this this movie did get a lot of criticism for that. For what? A lot of criticism for glorifying the vigilante, taking the law into your own hands. This caught a lot of heat for that. And to be fair, rightfully so, because it really does kind of celebrate that, especially in that final shot when he throws away his badge. The director has stated that that was not intended to instignify he quitting the police force. I don't know what you're supposed to take away from that. <laughs> and actually, that's how were, I took it. That's how I took it, too. I believe the director was on record saying that's not what it was intended. Actually, what happened was the the director, I got to look it up again. I think that was that was meant to be cut where Clint Eastwood was not going to do that. And he just did it anyway, last minute, and they kept it or something along those lines. Can may correct me on that. But anyway, I, this this is a very important movie in that regard, too, because it's got a lot of flack back in the day. It did. No less than Roger Ebert called it fascist. Yep. In The New Yorker, Pauline Kael said it was a deeply immoral movie. New York Times also called it fascist. Yeah, that's but fair. Both Don Siegel and Clint Eastwood deny that the movie is right wing. <laughs> yeah, thank okay. you. I, I I know what I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my eyes are working regardless of what you say. But okay, now maybe back in the seventies things were different. Sure, sure. but yeah. now the right wing is more yeah. <sighs> extreme. Let's just say that. Yeah, They're closer to fascism than oh, they God. used to be. I mean, if you look at like history in the 70s, like, who's president in the 70s? 71, who'd be president this time? Is that Carter? I can't remember. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's Carter. I can So I mean, you're also I mean, you come from you come from Johnson. You just have a different because you're coming to Nick, you're coming up to Nixon. Like you're just in a different time things where also like conservatism and Republicans were nothing like what we are seeing nowadays. Like, it's just a different thing. Conservatism wasn't what it is now, and it wouldn't seem that way. I mean, this is also a time when anything left-wing, you were, well, no, maybe the 80s, it gets more of your, no, this would have been the same time, if you're a communist, like, that was a whole big thing. Uh, this was, this was actually Nixon era. This is Nixon. Oh, is Nixon? Okay. Yeah, this is right in the heart of Nixon, so again. Okay, well, I mean, Nixon was good until he decided to say, I'm not a crook. He was good I, until then. I would argue that means he was never good. Yeah, well, he did do a couple good things, and he wasn't. In the press is a bad person. How about that? I don't know if he's ever a good guy, but he wasn't. I mean, com- the unfortunate part is I'm comparing him to other political figures. I'm like, hey, this guy is great compared to this shithead. So, yeah. All right. I mean, that, that's that's, that's unfortunately what I was comparing to. Did when? Oh, that's what I'm doing. So, yes. So, uh, funny enough, uh, well, Bill's muted. But, Bill, I found the thing you were talking about. Apparently, Clint Eastwood wanted to make a sequel. And so he didn't want. He didn't want Dirty Harry to quit to quit the police force at the end of the movie, but that's what the director wanted. So Clint Eastwood refused to show up to like film the movie for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> so it. what so what they ended up saying was that Dirty Harry throws away his badge because he's lost faith in the justice system. Gotcha. That's what it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, makes sense. I disagree, but okay, I'll I'll take it. And I mean, even then, like vigilanteism. I mean, maybe like when I was younger, I would think, "Oh, yeah, that's good, taking the law into your own hands." But now, in twenty twenty four, after I'm an adult, I'm like, "Yeah, that's terrible." <laughs> so we're hopping around a little bit, and I yes. want I want to talk about the reason what's around the vigilante thing. I want to talk about the reason why I got absolutely pissed off in the middle of this movie, <laughs> which is the big scene of him walking in the DA's office and being like, "Well, we can't charge the guy because." I may not know the law very well, but I know at least circumstantial evidence exists because I'm like 90 percent sure Clint Eastwood stabbed that guy in the ass. And then they went to go ask for info on him and then found his house. And it's like, well, you don't have a search warrant. Yeah, but you have circumstantial evidence. You know, you you went to the doctor looking for a guy that you stabbed, found the guy, went to his house, which technically wasn't even his house because he's squatting. And then you found evidence of him doing the shooting. Yeah, the the one thing that is fucked up is that he did torture him. But yes. it's also a thing of, well, you you can, you can't throw it out because you technically did find the girl at the end of the day. And I kind of feel like that's kind of where they had to draw the line at, too, which is still pretty fucked up. I mean, they still need, I think, still need to get some kind of search warrant to, to go on the property. Yeah, because it was technically private property. Yes. Yeah. 
he wasn't squatting he, in a public place where they could just go and like you're not supposed to be here. So yeah, yeah he he didn't go through the proper due process. He climbed a fence. <laughs> oh yeah, he climbed a fence. He climbed a yeah. fence to get in, right? Like he he's not supposed to be there, and and that's one of the things that the movie is saying. Again, the movie is trying to paint the justice system very clearly as wrong in this and saying, no, no, no. He had every right to go in there and invade his personal property and chase him through a football field and then shoot him with a revolver with pinpoint accuracy, by the way. <laughs> that hand cannon kicks like a dang mule. You th- I mean, the, the, how good he is with that thing is remarkable. But regardless, let's just think that's another story. What did he it, shoot him, by the way? Because if he shot him in the leg, he would have blown his fucking it, leg clean off. Yeah, he was at a distance. He was at a decent. He was at like. You're looking at that football field. He's kind of like at the sideline. He's a good was 30, 30 yards away. away. Yeah, like 30, yeah, it's... 30, 20 yards away, 30 yards. It's he's a ways away. So you're right. It should have taken his leg clean off. It, it did not, obviously. But it's really, again, it's one of those things where the movie's trying to say Clint Eastwood's actions are absolutely justified. And they are not like and I and the, and the, both the director, and I think Clint Eastwood have both said that Dirty Harry is not meant to be a hero character. He no. is a clear anti-hero. He's not a good guy. There are no, quote unquote, good guys in this movie. And you, oh, the dogs sorry, should not no. agree with you, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. I, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, you might be wrong. I might be wrong in that. But of those two antagonists, it's just different types of the. Obviously, we have the supervillain who is, you know, the 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 uh, the evil, evil, evil person. And then you have the cop who's just trying to protect people by going outside the lines and not caring about it. The lines are there for a reason. You know, that it's there is a bit of nihilism in that in that idea of vigilantism as attractive as it is to us who want immediate justice, because we want immediate justice, because when you have monsters like this character running around doing horrible things. You want them to be stopped immediately, right? The whole, but, the whole yeah. thing, with, the whole problem is that if you have that, you then create a lawless environment, whether you mean to or not, and then you get terrible situations. Yeah, right. You get frontier justice, which right. there's a reason the old West died out, y'all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, it's, it, it's not a sustainable method. And as much as we want that speedy justice, and as much as that's attractive to us from, a, I think, a very basic level, and still is, right? It's not the way to form a basis of government. It's not a way to – it's not It's not fair. You should get the search warrant and you should do the police work to hopefully rescue the girl. And what's interesting though is that they don't rescue the girl. That's what's really sad and, and heartbreaking is they do not rescue the girl. She ends up dead. The crazy person did not give in to, uh, to Clint Eastwood's threats. So again, I would argue that he did. I would also argue she was dead before she went into the hole. I think you're yes. right, too. I think. I agree. And that's actually what uh, Dirty Harry actually says. He's like, she's dead already. Why are we playing with this guy? Why are we paying him off? And But there's no way you can take that risk. The, 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 the city is like, look, we're, if there's any chance she's alive, we have to make an attempt. We can't be like, well, we don't, we don't give in to terrorists. Sorry. They don't like, anymore. No, they don't. No, they don't. Because it's never worked out very well when they had. They I was also worked. looking up. Other famous serial killers like Ted Bundy is after this. Like, God, it's just such a strange world. Like, the idea that serial killers aren't really a thing at this is just so bizarre to me. And I, that's not a good thing. <laughs> it, it is also really funny, too, that whenever they're like, oh, my God, he's a madman and a terrorist. What does he want? A hundred thousand dollars. And I'm like, I forgot that's a lot of money back then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That I know. Seems like I, a lot now. I totally I, d- I did that math in my head real quick when I heard that I was like hundred thousand bucks. Oh, yeah. Well, no, that's that's a chunk. That's a huge chunk of change in 1971. Yeah. Like there's that scene where Harry's talking about his pants and how they were like almost thirty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the 70s, those are two hundred dollar pants. Yeah. Essentially. That's a, lot. that's a very expensive pants. He's like those thirty dollar pants. I'll, I'll deal with some pain. I'll, I'll, I'll hurt. Like, excuse me, sir, but you have holes in them. You have blood coming through the holes in your pants. So that, that's not, I mean, I guess you yeah, just take it to a tailor, I guess, and get it worked out. But anyway, I mean, it's uh, also a neat little thing I just ran across. The, the role of Dirty Harry, Mr. Harry Callahan, was originally offered to John Wayne and Frank Sinatra. And Sinatra was attached to this for a long time. Like, Sinatra was going to play Dirty Harry. I could totally see John Wayne 
Actually, no, I can't see John Wayne because he's too much of the hero cowboy. I don't think that would have worked. And Sinatra, no. I absolutely can't see. Uh, but then it was later offered to, ready for this lineup, Robert Mitchum, Steve McQueen, and Burt Lancaster. I All of Steve which. McQueen. I can see Steve McQueen. I can kind of see Burt Lancaster. I don't know about Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum didn't want to do it because there was no amount of money in the world that could make him do this movie. Those were <laughs> like his words. However, his brother did it. Get out of here. Yeah, brother? His brother, John Mitchum, played DiGiorgio, the, the oh. heavy set gentleman. Oh, oh. Okay. yeah. Okay. So that's fun. Oh, George the- C. Scott was, was also asked to do this, and he said, forget it because it's too violent. Oh, my God. I can only imagine a world where George C. Scott plays Dirty Harry. I, I want to I visit that ultimate lion timeline and on Loki's timeline and just, just for like two hours and see that movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my God. That would be amazing. <laughs> so good. I want that to happen. Okay, Bill, I have the perfect device for you that I'm not going to reveal. <laughs> oh, and I looked up the amount of money. That, that would be $777,000 in today's money, that 100 k Oh damn you, Mike! I looked. I looked it up to you. I got a hundred. Oh. I got eight hundred nine thousand oh. dollars. Okay, oh. so that's roughly the equivalent of Doctor Evil asking for one million dollars. Yes, Thank and two hundred thousand. He was asking for. Wait, no, no, I put that in wrong. I added too many zeros. Two million is fifteen million today. One point five. Dang. I got one point six. It rounded up. <laughs> it is rounding up. <laughs> Dang. But that's like. A lot of money. And. They're they're good with it. They're gonna do it, and but Harry mother- fucks it up. I mean, to be fair, they they make that motherfucker run around like all of fucking San Francisco. I'd be pissed off too, and stab a motherfucker in the ass for making me run around San Francisco with a bright yellow bag, and then be like, "Don't be late." And it's like, motherfucker, it's like midnight in San Francisco. You expect me not to be robbed at some point? I mean, he does almost get robbed. <laughs> he does almost get robbed. So I did like that part. He pulls out the gun, like, "Hey, now, yeah." And I guess maybe guns weren't as common. Like nowadays, to me, the idea is that all those muggers would have pulled out guns too. But maybe the 70s are different. Guns weren't as common as they are now. You can just go buy them. I mean, I know guns have always been around, but I just maybe it wasn't as easy as it is now or as common as it is now. It's always going to be easier to get a switchblade. Yeah. It's easier to hide. It's easier to sneak on. Yeah. You, you don't, you, most people aren't going to have something to combat a switchblade, right? Like most people aren't carrying handguns on them. So usually that's probably enough. Um, yeah. Isn't a switchblade illegal in most yeah. states? Though? Yes. Okay. You, you're not. You're not allowed to have a a weapon that has. I think is it is a spring loaded. Is it is that the line that it draws with the switchblade? Spring loaded. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unless you live in Texas now, where Texas, where every any blade is now legal, even swords, as long as they're not over like I think seven feet long. <laughs> seven feet long. So unless you have a real cloud sword, a real. Um, <laughs> God, freaking Texas. Oh, yeah. Texas. I forgot what happened, but Texas like passed some law. They're like, yeah, from now on, they because they, they, they want to legalize swords for some reason, but they fucked up the writing, so they made it to where now every like knife is legal. So it's like, oh, fuck it, whatever. Then so you can get those really cool, fancy spring loaded knives and those gravity knives. But and why? It's Texas. I mean, Texas. Who was asking to legalize swords anyway? Like, what does it matter? Um, me. Me. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I think <laughs> the world would be a lot more interesting if people open carried swords. <laughs> open carried swords. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it'd be easier to get away from a sword than a gun. They gotta catch you first. I don't know, man. People can throw. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, if I was in a store and some guy tried to rob the store with a sword, I would pull out my own sword. <laughs> like, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I've been trained my whole life for this moment. I've been training yeah. my whole life for this moment. <laughs> While you studied girls in high school, I studied the blade. I really did study <laughs> the blade in high school. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, another thing I, I want to bring up, like, to go with, like, showing that I, I think when the movie's trying to show you Dirty Harry's not exactly the, the best character, at least maybe not to some people we use it, maybe certain people are like, oh, yeah, he's a great guy. Because, like, this part when he's supposed to be watching for the sniper. And he's freaking just watching some <laughs> naked woman walk around her apartment and open the door, you know? And then, like, when she's getting ready to have a threesome, essentially, just like, he's like, he's like, you, you owe it to yourself. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> Two other Live women. Oh, my God. It was so messed up. But, you know, he's he's not somebody you're... You're not supposed to problem, idolize him. You're not supposed to. But this is, like, fertile boomer alpha male meme territory here. Yeah. 
Like, I'm willing to bet somewhere out there there's a picture of Dirty Harry talking about loyalty and dangerous when crossed and, and, and. Like, it's the same thing with the Peaky Blinders crowd and the Joker memes. Like, we live in a society. We do like whenever, live in a society. Whenever, the, I, whenever, I have a, whenever I know a woman that says, yeah, when I was like Joker and Harley Quinn, I want to go, you don't know what you're saying. <laughs> mm. I don't know, man. Maybe some people do. I mean, yes, but also I, the person that made this comment that I'm referencing did not know comic books either. So, <laughs> to to be fair, we are now at two for two movie iterations where the Joker and the Harley Quinn have a healthy relationship, which is really weird, but it's also terrifying how it's happened twice. <laughs> what are you referencing the Suicide Squad movie with? That's not healthy. It actually surprisingly is not bad either. Like he. Cat, you know, like he does not beat her that whole movie. They cut that from the original script. <laughs> they <And>, cut. <laughs> yeah. And then the new the new Joaquin Phoenix, which is a musical with Lady Gaga, is also shown to be a healthy romance, which is also weird. You have yet to see, but okay. Yeah, the movie's not out yet, so I'm only counting. I'll give you now. one nickel. Uh, maybe one nickel. I don't consider Suicide Squad <laughs> I, a good relationship. I'm holding this other nickel in my back pocket till that fucking movie comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Before we wander away from the cast too much, I do want to follow in Bill's footsteps and throw a little bone to the mayor of San Francisco. That is literally his name, the mayor, as portrayed by John Vernon, who is going to get Dirty Harry in double secret d- probation. <laughs> I was waiting for a joke of some sort. Damn it. Damn it. That's a good one. Yeah, he's great. Nice. Oh, I love John Vernon. He's so okay. much fun. So good in in everything I've seen him in. Oh yeah, Animal House. What else? Oh my Is he god, the Dean in Animal House. Yeah, yep, yep. Okay. He's Dean Wormer. Yep, Dean Wormer. He he did a lot of TV stuff too. He played Rupert Thorne in the Batman the Animated Series. Oh, like he's he's done a lot of stuff. He's done a lot. Tales from the Crypt. I uh, a lot of TV stuff. Most of his movie stuff though was like in the earlier '80s. He was in Ernest Goes to Camp. Anybody besides me remembers that movie? Uh, that amazing I movie. I I don't I don't have a <laughs> I don't have a fondness for Ernest, and I don't know why. <laughs> I I'm not, I I have a funny feeling you do, and I'm trying to say this as gently as possible. I just don't I don't know. Maybe it was just got exposed to Ernest at the wrong time. <laughs> Mike, you have the opportunity to do something really <laughs> funny here. Damn. I mean, Ernest is dumb as fuck. <laughs> you should have known that was coming. I've only seen I am <laughs> shaken. I've never seen any of them. I just, I've just never I wanted to, and I've to seen my like core. parts of it, and I'm like, this is. But I, also, I don't like comedy a whole lot, so I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't, I don't have enough uh, Ernest experience to, to, to comment. On, on on the body of his work. So why am I being so careful around Ernest? I have a funny, I, I just, from, from the sound effects mm. coming from Kenneth's microphone, I, it sounds like he's a big fan. I don't want to insult yes, the man because I don't, I don't, I don't have a big, I really don't know much about Ernest. So here, here's the thing. I'm not a big fan. I know the Ernest movies are dumb. They were just a very formative part of my childhood. Growing up, I used to watch Ernest Goes Camp a lot. You might also recognize him from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, okay. Fantastic! I fucking hate that movie with the fucking passion that is my soul. People, wow. p- p- people make that joke where it's like, oh, you don't, you don't, you don't like clowns because of it, right? It's like, no, that movie's fucking hilarious. Fucking Tim Curry breaks that role like, uh, uh, you know, great way. Fucking killer clowns from outer space. Fucking hate that movie. I hate the clowns. I hate the <laughs> plot. I hate the fucking makeup. I hate the fucking stunts. I hate everything but that goddamn fucking movie. Show me where the movie hurts you. You're like, here, here. It's all over. It's a, here's the doll. Just take the whole thing. That's where it hurt me. And one more, one more note on 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 the great John Vernon for our video game fans out there. He played he played Rhombus in the worst Fallout game, uh, which is Brotherhood of Steel. <laughs> so <laughs> if you remember that that ill fated uh, terrible game, you you you've heard the very voice of Dean Wormer. All right. Wow. I know of that game. Bill, you've played the original Fallout games. Oh, uh, Brotherhood of Steel is a PS2 game. Yeah. And Xbox. Oh, yeah. I was on PS2 and Xbox, yeah. What is it? I don't know. I just know it exists. Kind of garbage. That I know, I, too. Yeah, I, I've never personally played it, but I, I, I know it by reputation. The thing I will always choose to remember him for is Rupert Thorne from the Batman animated series. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Like, 
he was the best gangster on that show. Yeah, it's a very commanding voice. Yeah. He's great. And Dean Wormer, of course, from Animal House. But he's done a lot of other stuff. I definitely recommend looking at some of it. Personally, I would recommend uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. I'm going to get you Sucka, the wonderful black exploitation spoof from the Waynes Brothers. He played Mr. Big in that one. Man's got, he's, he's got experience being a heavy. Like, he's the bad guy a lot. And it's great. He's good <laughs> at it. And in this movie, he has a goddamn chrome-plated phone. <laughs> I want Let's that go. phone so bad. Great phone. <laughs> it's an excellent phone. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. This is a this is this is Dirty Harry, right? right. They do do a, they do a good job of making you hate Scorpio and show you like how much of a villain he is throughout this. Like it's after because when you you see that he the the woman that he kept the girl he captured, they make sure you know she's underage, which like you know they go through their trouble to make sure you know that, and then by how he put her in the hole, like the idea that she is killed. He also shoots a, a, a young kid in the head too because they won't pay him. Yeah, he's he's yeah, that's he's a monster. Right. Yeah, that scene where he like walks in the store and he's like, "Hey, buddy, how's it going?" He's like, "I heard you've been robbed a couple times," and it's <laughs> like, "Yeah," and then he just absolutely like smashes him in the head with a bottle. Is like, "Oh, that really makes you fucking feel bad," especially because they're they're just off the heat of like, "Oh, well, Harry's probably not in trouble because of the fake beating that he did." Oh, that scene. That's that- also a good scene. Mm-hmm. That got me. I I have a. I've said this on the show before. I really have a hard time when movies depict people just being beaten defenselessly. Like if like a yeah. good fight scene is fun because it's a combat, right? And someone can win, someone can lose. But someone just getting punched and then sat up again and then punched again is really hard for me for some weird reason. I mean, I think, and maybe that shouldn't be weird because that means I'm not a crazy person potentially. Crazy person. I don't know. I've no, you know, I've no one, no one should for... enjoy that. <laughs> Five no, no. years? You're not a no, great no. person. No, I, yeah. I get you. I get you, Bill. You know what makes me feel like really ooky? What's that? Whenever like it, it's either it's either horror. I love horror movies. Everyone knows like horror movies. Whenever like a character gets beat to death with like a baseball bat, and you see like Ugh. the body like flinching, like that really gets me. Like, yeah. I don't mind yeah. anything else. I watch I watch both Terrifiers, but anything like that really gets me. Yeah. See, we all have those weird little lines. Yeah. That's anything that is just someone's defenseless and being like mm-hmm. knocked around is. Even though this person did pay two hundred dollars, which again is like probably over over a grand nowadays. Fifteen hundred. Yeah, I'll say fifteen. Does he probably. really need to pay someone two hundred dollars to beat you up? I feel like you could find someone to pay them a lot less to do it. Well, beat you up you, perfectly. Yeah, just the right way to cause the right kind of damage that would be visible. Again, the whole I, idea is that he needed to have a couple of crack ribs, but not like killed. Although he did get that one extra shot. <laughs> that was hilarious. End. He's like, this is for free. And oh, yeah. He kind of kind of kind of brought that upon himself. I think it was a little racially motivated, too. Yeah, I do. Think he calls him calls him something yeah. that was racially. So, oh, I mean, of all the racial things you could be called. Yeah, that was probably one of the lesser. Also, lesser in this movie, too. So, yeah, because they say the N word in this movie, too. They yeah. word a lot in this movie. Yeah. Scorpio even says it in a letter. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking <laughs> of. It, again, it's the time. It is. It is. And I mean, none of that bothered me. I mean, I don't like it when it's in movies, but when it's in a movie that is a period piece, I mean, it's not a period piece, but because this took place at a period, you know, at the period of time when it's supposed to be today and this all was today in 1971, 1969, like I have no problem with it because it fit what we're doing. Now, if this was made, this was like supposed to be in 2024 and that's all you're talking, then I would have issues. To be fair, we, we also go into an issue where it's this is the bad guy. Like we we are to establish he is the bad guy. He it makes him a bad guy because he is racist and also an asshole. <laughs> and a killer. Yeah. And a rapist. And a rapist. Oh, one thing always bothers me in movies, and I have seen it now in two different things that I have watched I'm talking about this weekend. Only one that's happened. When people when they pull someone's t- teeth out, that bothers me so oh, yeah. much that I hate tooth pain. I'd be like, just fucking shoot me in the head. Like, just end it right here. <laughs> Don't even like I like you you're, you're gonna pull your teeth out or shoot you. I'd be like, I will take the bullet, sir. Right in the head, please. Leave my teeth alone. <laughs> oh, it bothers me. When he when he sends the molar, I'm just like, ah! just do not I cannot handle that. Like that is one of those things that bothers me so much. I hate I do not like teeth being pulled out. Teeth are great. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. I yeah, the teeth are not good. Can you give me a, fair. Can you do me a favor? I need to find a horror game for Mike to play where the weapon, the bullets are teeth. Uh, uh, Shadows of the Damned. Done. 
the fact that you were able to conjure up that name and I, with such authority, <laughs> but I don't I even want to bother fact checking you. You could be lying completely. I'm the, not. The fact that you you just instantly and this was just folks listening. That was not <laughs> editing, by the way. There was not like ten <laughs> seconds of hemming and hawing and. And clicking and clacking on the keyboard. Oh no, Mr. Sanity just rocked that out immediately. Is very, very admirable, sir. <laughs> well, you know my editing, because had there been a space in clickety clackety, it wouldn't be by the time you heard the final product. Nope. <laughs> nope. There is no editing in there, y'all. That was immediate. Trust me. On my show, there's all sorts of editing with the la- letting people to hem and haw and think about answers. So I know exactly what those breaks sound like. This is not that, friends. That was <laughs> it was pretty fast. <laughs> well done. Uh, to, I have played Shadows of Dam once. I like that game. I I mean, to be fair, game. Ken, I love that game too. Ken did respond, but Mike also did respond with Alice Madness Returns, where I forgot you do collect heat for like currency or upgrades. Yes, upgrade which your weapons. Is. That also yeah, bothered so. me a bit, by the way. Yeah, you <laughs> just played that. I, I mean, I, just, I also, I think I'm more sensitive now. I had, a, I had my first twos ripped out of my face not too long ago, so not, and it took me two different dentists because they couldn't get the fucker out. So I'm also more like, Bleh! just not okay with it. There were no pliers involved, and I was sedated heavily. I wasn't just... <laughs> but the idea of just having it ripped out of your mouth? Wait, fuck no. Fuck no. I'm not kidding. I would say shoot me. If that. If the, if the only option is here, rip out my teeth or shoot me in the head, let's take the bullet now. I'll leave peacefully. I'm not joking. <laughs> I would shoot death. Also, good, if you're in that situation, there's a good chance that death is coming no matter what, so we might as well get it done faster. So... <sighs> I want to talk about Bruce Surtees for a bit. Sure. I don't know who that is. Bruce Surtees is a cinematographer on this movie. Mm -hmm. And Jesus Christ, he did the work. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like he did an amazing job of capturing, you know, 1970s nighttime San Francisco. Yeah. This movie, so much of it is dark and the light that stands out like, Most of the screen is black, except for, you know, buildings in that have lights on them or the rotating Jesus saves sign. (laughs) Like there's some (laughs) amazing play on light versus dark in this movie. Yes. Which, of course, you know, overall picture that's like the theme of the movie. But like, it's just it's such an amazing looking movie and there the the and the aerial shots were were groundbreaking for the time that was a that was a really big deal those kind of helicopter shots um that long shot for, uh, especially the beginning in that opening where it kind of i think it pans out all the way to his gun focusing in on the swimmer yeah this is a movie that looks great and then yeah that lends to that neo-noir again we get to that yeah. combination of light and darkness which is very very noir that's what film noir does that that definitely also lends itself to that. Now this movie looks phenomenal. I mean, it looks great, and it still does. Yeah, it still holds up. It's it's shot beautifully, and uh, that's one of the big hallmarks for me. Which again makes makes this action, which really is just at the most two people going pachoo 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 <laughs> two at each other. It still hits, and it still has great moments in it. I have a question that I asked Mike. I'm hoping both of you answer it for me. Please tell me y'all guys comment the shot and those those shots in that last scene. No, I sure as hell. God no. damn it. I, but I already look, knew. I, I thought remember, about I it. remember the ending. I thought about it, and I didn't want to. I I countered him, and I I actually you actually do get lost at one point. Is when they're both in the hallway, and I think uh, Scorpio's taking pot shots. You're not sure who shot. So <laughs> there's it more is, than enough a, time for Harry to reload at any point. Yeah, it's not yeah. out where like in the in the bank robbery part where he's literally just shooting as he's walking, where he doesn't have time to reload a revolver. So. To be, to be fair, that line of dialogue is up over the guy going, I have to know, and he, he pulls a trigger. It's probably like... Oh, well, he doesn't say I have to know. He says, I gots to I know. gots to know. Which, yeah, all right. But, like, right. Uh, it, it's a great line. <laughs> I fucking love it. I say that. I, I didn't know where it came from this. I've been saying <laughs> that for a long time. I got and now I'm going to say it more. I stole it from How I Met Your Mother. Apparently, How I Met Your Mother stole it from this. I'm not surprised. I'm not either. Like, it's... <laughs> this movie's just wild. And it- Bruce Surtees would go on to shoot some amazing movies. Like, uh, The Outfit. Great, uh, great mob movie. Uh, he would go on to shoot a mo- little movie called Risky Business. Oh, yeah. Uh, Escape from Alcatraz. Beverly mm-hmm. Hills Cop. Psycho 3. Don't be a hater. Psycho 3 is great. 
<laughs> uh, the Crush with Alicia Silverstone. Like he's made some amazing looking movies, and we were we were blessed. We we're all blessed for his time on this earth because he made some amazing stuff. And then there's the music. Music is good in this movie too. I, I oh. mean, but it's different time. Like it's when you made music really. I mean, I feel like this is a movie of that age where it's just different, where the music was made to really emphasize moments because we don't have the technology that we would have now. Maybe I. I feel bad. I'm going to pull the mic pole. I did not actually pay attention to the music in this movie. Uh, that's you, fair. You, you, you may not have, but to quote, to quote the great Plinkett reviews, your brain did because the music is so <laughs> integral to the, uh, to the pacing of this movie. It's, it's beaut- It's expertly done. Like the music and the score is just fantastic. The, the way the certain beats hit at certain times, matching the action. Well, really drives the action you may and the fact that you didn't notice it is actually a good thing because it just did its job and did its job well yes i'll take that <laughs> and, and you should because that's exactly what's happening he's one of the best one of the best uh composers of film score in history uh the great uh Lalo Schifrin, uh who would make a little theme that everybody knows uh for a tiny little show called mission impossible hmm. back in the day uh, he also oh. did the music for <laughs> for George Lucas's first film, THX 1138. Hey, <laughs> I've never seen it. I never bothered. Is it worth it? It's a movie. OK, good. That's exactly what I was hoping you would say. Well, great. I don't need to bother. That's fantastic. I don't know. Uh, yeah, he got yeah, no. Yeah, he's again another celebrated. He's done so much work. Yeah, like yeah, just, a ridiculous amount. Yeah. Uh, even a lot of modern stuff, too. He did the yep. score for Rush Hour. He oh. did, like, uh, what was that one? Uh, Enter the Dragon. Like, he's done, he did the theme for Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow. Should really play that series one day. <laughs> like, he's he's done a lot of great seminal works of music. And more power to him. Yeah, he's Great, a, he's uh, a composer that people don't know exists, but they they've heard their his music before. Like you've heard his stuff, mm-hmm. and still kicking at the ripe old age of ninety two. My man, still kicking. <laughs> My man. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. I don't know why I had. Oh, to. <laughs> I love it. No, yeah. don't don't. Perfect. It's great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> me and uh, me and Lalo, best buds. My man. <laughs> Uh, a couple things that I, I want to I want to talk about. So, like when he goes and robs the bus or hijacks the bus, mm-hmm. I think that's another great scene. Like where you start to really see him losing it. Oh, yeah. I don't, this yeah. actor does it. Like we, I know we talked about him earlier, but the way he screams a couple different times in this movie, like that is hella good acting. Smacks the hell out of that kid who wants to go home. Oof. I don't, yeah, good. that was good. Ugh. Like when you just start seeing him lose control because he comes off, he's very calm and cool. And then you, you can just be starting to lose control of what's happening, and especially when he sees Callahan standing on top of the freaking bridge before he jumps <laughs> on the bus, he really loses it then. Oh, man. That picture of Callahan standing on the bridge, like, I got goosebumps. Not gonna lie. When I, I just saw him pants. standing there, <laughs> hip-cocked, just like, hey, what's going on over there, guy? And just, like, just oh, shit. Like, like this, like the devil has appeared. Like, oh, no. Oh, no. He's he- He's here. How could this possibly happen? All my schemes, all my plans to get this guy off my back. He's not <laughs> listening. He's not doing what the police say to do. I got myself beaten to almost to death. <laughs> I spent $200, the equivalent of $1,500 today's money, to actually get beaten to death just so this guy would stop chasing me. And now this guy won't stop chasing me. <laughs> it's the, 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 the realization on his face of... Oh no, he's not going to stop. I have now have a, a, a curse upon me. The curse upon both my houses. But also, oh, no. like, what city was going to pay that? Because what chance do you have that the person is actually going to give up their hostages after they land wherever they're headed? Well, again, I don't. Yeah. We have the benefit of hindsight now. But back in the 70s, they didn't have a playbook for this. Okay. That's another that thing sense. that, like, we I don't understand exactly or can you know will blow past me because it's hard for me to picture the world not the world that I'm in and to forget that some of the stuff isn't just isn't a normal everyday thing like it is, or not everyday but a normal thing in our world like it is now unfortunately I I don't know what the rules for that that is now like I don't know I I don't, don't know 
fuck I mean, you. It, That's the word rules it, now, pretty much. Rule is like, we just don't do it. Yeah, you yeah. don't care what you do. Yeah. You can do it privately, but the government will not get involved in any shape or way. I've watched a whole documentary series called Hostages on Netflix. Yeah, okay. they don't do shit. They're like, oh, wow. that's so, nice. I mean, they, I they just like, we don't pay. Like, yeah. we don't pay nothing. We'll get you in contact with people who will help try to facilitate if you have the money and want to pay. And we'll try to, like, help you, but the government itself does not get involved. Yeah, normally those those things that happen now is either, A, yeah, we pay you the money, but it's not either, A, not real money, or B, there's a big fucking paint bomb inside of it, or B, the moment you step outside to grab the bag, you're getting shot in the fucking head. So it's it's usually one of the two. We not like what happens in this. No, and, I mean, uh, they're going to just pay them, like, they, and they're all upset at Callahan, like, you fucked up. Like, the guy even said, I'm going to, sh- the girl's dead. I'm not, you know, I'm going to kill her anyway. Like, it doesn't help plus, any. Plus, to... to to also agree with that as well you you've already paid him a hundred thousand dollars and whenever he took the money callahan heard him say oh i don't really give a shit i've already killed the girl so if, what promise is he gonna make to where if it's two hundred thousand dollars he's just not gonna blow up the bus and fuck off yeah especially it was he was gonna take the kids with him on the plane to wherever he's headed what makes you think he's gonna tell the pilot okay fly him back like why also yeah. just you just kill everybody but it's a bunch of kids and Mayor's still got to be elected. <laughs> Fair. So, like, at the end of the day, they got to try to save those kids. I also really do, appre- I, I guess, maybe I did back then, especially now, watching that whole ending scene where they're running through the factory, or not factory, but the refinery. That's a really good scene. Every chase scene in this movie is good. Like, when... Dirty Harry and his partner are running after Scorpio. They're running down the stairs. It's shot very claustrophobically in the staircases. Like that refinery scene is just, you can feel the action going on. It's very tightly coordinated. So good. And the kid that Scorpio takes hostage at the end of the movie, that's uh, Andrew Robinson's stepson. Oh, that's pretty cool. It's just fun. Just fun. I like just that, fun. where he's like, you know, he he thinks he won and Dirty Harry starts to lower the gun and then just shoots him anyway. Like, that's a good scene. Yeah. I mean, not as good as dropping the gun than dropping down before the gun, grabbing it and shooting a barrel behind the people. But I'll take it. It's pretty good. Nothing, Joe? Uh, you know, this, no, no. Is that some I mean, Resident Evil bullshit? Yeah, it's Resident Evil Code Veronica joke reference. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. And it's also one of the Ari movies, I'm pretty sure. But <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's a lot of Magnum jokes in Resident Evil. You gotta be more specific sometimes. Oh, I mean, where what Claire does when she's being arrested in that one in the first cut scene, when the cut scene oh, with Veronica. Uh, yeah, that, that's in that's in that one, and it's also in the second movie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I knew it was in more than one place. So dumb. <laughs> mm-hmm. So dumb. So one. dumb indeed. I, I don't. I just I like that, and then the fact that the and I I did not think about this when I watched this movie 20 years ago, but I thought about it now. When he does do the final part, when he asks him, well, do you feel lucky, punk? And it's essentially just a foreshadowing to what you had in the beginning of the movie, or that was foreshadowing to this. And it's just, it's so good, because that guy doesn't do it when he's bluffing, and this one, he's not bluffing. Which is why I think he totally reloaded during that <laughs> shootout. And he just gave the speech to be an asshole. Like, he knew that he had the shot. The shot was there. He's wanting to kill him, because at that point, had he not killed him... It would have been worse. Yeah. And they probably could have thrown it out in court again, too, because he jumped on the fucking bus. <laughs> Man, like, OK, Clint Eastwood did that stunt. Mm-hmm. Like he did a lot of the stunts in this movie, like a lot of the dirty, hairy stunts. That was Clint Eastwood. Oh, that's cool. So, like, props to him. Uh, he also directed the scene in which he had to get that jumper down. Oh, oh yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, like, they, okay, so they call him Dirty Harry because he does all the dirty jobs no one else wants to. Yeah, okay, whatever. They call him Dirty Harry because he's looking at hot Tina. <laughs> oh, I thought, call, I thought you were going to go with they call him Dirty Harry because he's a fucking asshole. <laughs> that or a pervert. Too. There's that, too. There's so many reasons to call him Dirty Harry. But um, at one point, he has to talk a guy down off the ledge and... Like, he's insulting the guy so that the guy takes a jump and, like, tries to punch him. <laughs> that what it was? Yeah. I thought he was just trying to jump to grab on because he didn't want to die. No, no, he, he was gonna. He wanted to. But, he, like, he got pissed off at Harry and took a swing. And then Harry just kind of bopped him right in the beak and knocked him out and brought him back down. To be fair, I will agree with what Harry said. Jumping from the roof, especially if you don't do it high enough, because that guy was, what, maybe three stories up? Four or five, I think. But... He was high enough, I can speak for a fact, unfortunately. I was, gonna, 
I was going to say you he may not have been high enough cuz sometimes like legitimately if if you're not high enough you you're one of two options either you become completely paralyzed cuz your dumbass falls on your feet or you're you're going to feel it at the end like it's it's not going to be pretty either way because I speaking with the Mall of America, someone jumped off the fourth floor and died, and I know somebody jumped off the second floor and broke his legs because he was trying to run from the cops, and they just picked him up anyway. So then we're gonna go up. <laughs> he literally he jumped on the thing to get away from the cops. Which if you've been to the Mall of America, they're fucking a police station below where he is, right below where he was anyway. Like you weren't going anywhere. You ain't gonna be able to get away. And he was trying to run from them, so he jumped off. So he jumped off the thing. And they just and he broke his leg, and they just went and picked him up. I, I wish Bill was here for this joke, so I'll make that joke, and I hope he gets it and hears it. I mean, you can't really say anything, Mike. That guy from Midsommar survived that fucking jump. They had to take him out with a hammer. <laughs> oh, yeah. He didn't fall right. Yeah, they, his right. shin bones, like, shot through his kneecaps, so... <laughs> what was what was he? What were they, like, 30 feet up? 40 feet up? I don't know, I but think? I'm fucking... That movie, man. That movie, <laughs> oh, that movie bothered me. Supposed to, to be fair. So. Not as much as hered- Hereditary. That really bothered me, but yeah. I, I still think Midsummer is a dark comedy. No, Mid- Midsummer is is a reason to that you should break up with your boyfriend. Hereditary is the equivalent of, hey, you may hate your sibling, just avoid these things. <laughs> okay, so Midsummer is why you should break up with your boyfriend. Hereditary is why you should break up with your family. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is the view is not afraid, which I have not seen yet? Oh, Bo is Bo is afraid. I haven't watched it yet. Okay, been waiting for the right time. I e waiting. For the show to make me do it. Okay, that it's been on my mind because I, we did his other movies. Why not? I, I'm upset because I still haven't seen Long Legs yet, and I fucking hate myself. Oh, you should see Long. Legs. I need to, but I have not had any time. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> oh, and speaking of Long Legs, my wife has actually seen it right now because when Ken said the movie unsettled him, I was like, "Babe, you need to go see this." I don't want to go see it. I ain't going anywhere near I, it. But if it unsettled Ken, you're probably gonna like it. Yeah, I, I love being unsettled, especially because I have to get high and go be unsettled. Um, Ken, have you seen what's that fucking movie that takes place in the house that came out recently? That narrows it down. You're going to have to be more specific, homeboy. <laughs> uh, it, it was a, it was an indie film. Maybe... You have to be more specific, boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah uh, uh, it'll come to you later. It takes place in the house. And there's no toilet at one point. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, See, if you have no toilet, you just use the floor. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. Oh, another thing that I don't think what else I want to say. I am like watching this movie again. Like I actually bought this on Am- on Amazon Prime because I didn't want to rent it rent it because I didn't want to have the Dark City thing where I'm trying to well, talk watch it and talk about it and I can't because the rental went away. Mm-hmm. So I just said fuck it, paid the thirteen dollars unfortunately and just bought it. And plus I I like this movie enough. So I, I was like I'm fine on, with owning it. I got it on sale for five bucks, so I ain't mad at it. I, I thought about buying the DVD, but they're like, it will be delivered by Sunday. I'm like, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> I just forgot to look at this was streaming anywhere that I could stream it versus buying it at the time, unfortunately. And sometimes I sometimes I'm more prepared. Like I knew this. I mean, I knew we were doing this. It's just I don't know. I just didn't order it. But I also don't really like DVDs as much because the way that I watch movies, it can be sporadic and can be on different devices. So sometimes I like having that ability to move around and not be tied to a PlayStation. And see, that's completely different for me. I, I love my physical media. I love my physical media. I may have a physical media problem, but I love it. And it's always going to be better quality than streaming. The colors are going to be deeper. You know, everything's just going to be more full of life, more the way the director originally intended. I will always watch physical media whenever I have the chance. No, that's fair. I'm just, it's just the way that I've been doing things lately. And, and some weeks I'm so fucking busy that it's just like, it's hard to get things in when I don't find them fast. <laughs> don't do them fast enough. I've been, this week I was watching Cowboy Bebop and I didn't get a rip. That's why it took me a while to get to this too. Yeah. Yeah. Cowboy Bebop. Let's start talking about Cowboy Next week. Uh, or no, not next week. Tomorrow. What am I talking about? Tomorrow for us. Next week or the week after for you guys. <laughs> or oh, later, it, I don't remember. It was Skin of Rink. I, oh, uh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, I, I, I ate an edible and watched Skin in my Rink and went, this movie is boring. And then I went to bed still high and went, fuck, there is something in the corner of my goddamn room and I cannot sleep. OK, funny thing. You mentioned this for a year now. A fucking year. <laughs> I am still a bit unsettled after we watch Halloween, because when he That's comes fair. in the room after they have se- when they when when he after they have sex and the, and the guy went down to get a beer and, and then gets killed. 
and he's standing in the room. I always look at my door and make sure there's no one standing there. What am I going to do if someone's there? No idea what my naked ass is going to do because I sleep naked. But I stare at that door and go, hmm, nobody there? Okay, good. Every time. And I blame that fucking... It wasn't until the damn Halloween movie we watched. You got, you, you've got to learn how to dance fight, Mike. He, 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 like, a serial killer won't attack you if he's mesmerized by you dancing naked trying to defend yourself. <laughs> I mean, I've honestly thought about buying a baseball bat and having it underneath the bed, but I haven't done that yet because it just seems stupid because if you're robbing my house, you probably have a gun and a baseball bat versus a gun, you're going to win. Oh, dude, do, do, do the old English method. Just buy a fucking crossbow. I don't want anything after projectiles. My gu- yeah, I'm also projectiles are a lot easier to claim premeditation. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you rob my house, house and I beat you with a baseball bat. I mean, I don't think I have to worry too much about it. But you would also think, at the same time, and I live in a yet, pretty safe place. And yet, that's entirely what this movie is talking about, is it, the idea that criminals have more rights than the cops that pursue them. And, you know, I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. I am saying that I have seen that argument made a lot over the many years that I've been alive. And you know, it's not an argument that goes away. No, it's an argument that I might have at one time agreed with, and but like it's not. It's always. I mean, I mean, again, this movie is a whole idea of how much power the police have, and I mean, this is also before you have the the bank rob sh- the bank robber shooting where they have way more powerful weapons than the, than the police have. Like it's a different time. I was also thinking about this. Do do cops even have magnums as like their handgun? Like is that an option? Nope. Okay. No, the running assumption is that that's from uh, Harry's personal collection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering about that, because, like, a Magnum is a bit extreme of a weapon to have as your sidearm. I want to say this is also back in the day where they did use revolvers, at least. So he was actually was going up in, like, I guess, caliber. But I also want to say it's the douchebag cop equivalent of today where it's like, oh, you have a Glock 45. You have a Glock 40 for the police official firearm. Yeah, I'll use a 1911 for my fucking sidearm. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I think that'd be like, okay, first off, the 1911 is a solid gun. Second off, I don't know. I feel like that'd be like somebody using a Desert Eagle as a cop. That's fair. Because, again, the idea of a cop is that you're supposed to subdue the person, not kill them. And we've already seen, unfortunately, through history that it doesn't take a whole lot to kill a person. Sure. Nope. Sure doesn't. So, I mean, you can kill a person on 22 just fine. You don't need a fucking Magnum. That's when your purpose is to disarm them, not to destroy them. It's supposedly. It's supposed to be. You can cut this out, Mike, Bill. We've been waiting for you to get back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. My son had a nightmare. Oh, no, uh, no, no. No worries. Oh, cool. We're That's talking it. about nightmares. It's okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Actually... Hey. Oh, one last thing since you just mentioned since the, the nightmare thing came up. I also blame you for this, Ken. Every Now, whenever I have a nightmare or a dream, I always think of Sandman immediately after I wake up. The first thing goes through my head. Awesome. I blame you. So, Ken, what did you want to say? All right. So, we talked earlier, I talked earlier about the plot summary, and I said, keep something in mind, because it will come up later, right? Now, do you guys remember what my plot summary for this movie was? Uh, I only remember it was really good. Okay, so I'm going to replace some names here, but otherwise read it exactly as I wrote it earlier. Okay. Tell me if it sounds familiar. Batman is tough on crime. When a madman named the Joker begins terrorizing Gotham City, promising to kill one person a day unless his demands are met, Batman begins to hunt the Joker to the ends of the city, sometimes having to resort to extra-legal methods in order to take out the Joker. Batman takes it on himself to become a pariah, dissolution by the system he believed in, and wages a one-man war to take the Joker down for good. And with that, I shit my pants. (laughs) <laughs> this movie that is, is so damn right. basically the prototype for the Dark Knight, and Scorpio is 100% the 70s version of the Joker. Wow. wow. He is, isn't he? And he wow. hijacks a bus full of kids. Yes. Yeah. Holy. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. And that's impressive, because you've never seen this movie before either, so. Yeah, and I I didn't see anybody else ever say anything about this at that's all. Am- that's amazing. That's like, that's amazing. That's, uh, am- yeah. Wow. I am shocked. And I am too. Now that you, the way you put it out, like, damn, that is a really good comparison. Great. Now I got to watch Dark Knight Rises for like the fifth time today. Now, <laughs> the funniest thing is that when the Joker came out and everybody was making those speculations about the Joker's background, one of them was essentially the story that Robinson came up for Scorpio. That he was wow. drafted into war, saw the horrors done in the name of the country that he served. When he returned home and saw how badly soldiers were treated, he went insane 
and became the Joker we know. That's crazy. Wow. It's that's just fair. The whole Scorpio kidnapping the girl and burying her, promising to let her go if the game is played. Multiply it by two. It's Harvey Dent and Rachel. Yep. Exactly. Oh, damn. Pick one. Damn. Damn. Where he gets the shit beat out of him just to put the cop where he wants him to be. Yep. The Batman interrogation scene. Yep. Oh, God. Yep. Oh, oh my wow. God. He, he even has holding the kids hostage like Harvey Dent's kid. Yeah. Not Harvey Dent, the commissioner's uh, Gordon. kid. Yeah. yeah. Gordon's kid. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I did not see that coming, Ken. All right. Well like, done, it's, Ken. It's insane. Do we have any last things you guys want to say? Or should we go to Shelf Stacker Box? Look, we covered everything, especially after that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I can follow that. I cannot follow that. That was awesome, man. Well I done. can't follow that. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. Okay, let's go to Shelf Stacker Box. And Ken, why don't you go first? I'll put this on the shelf. Like, there's a lot to put to like about this movie. There is a lot to like about this movie. But I, I talked said in the chat earlier, I like this movie. I dug it until I made the realization that I did, and now I love it. <laughs> seeing <laughs> seeing Dirty Harry as a blueprint for one of the best comic book movies of all time, it's absolutely stunning. And I'm going to do double feature of both of them one of these days just to see how right I am. That's so good. That'll, that'll be a lot of fun. So yeah, hundred percent shelf for me. Okay, and Bill, I kind of went back and forth a little bit. This is going to be a very high stack, uh, not quite shelf for me. More for personal taste than anything else. I don't. I, I enjoy the genre, that vigilante genre, that seventies action movie to a certain degree, but it's not something I think I would be running out to see over and over again. Nor would it something to be on my on my shelf. So, but. I do think this is very culturally significant. I think there's a lot of great things in here. It's a well-made movie on, in all respects, from again cinematography to direction to acting. This is a quality-made movie. It's just not the sort of flavor I think I go back to very often. So for that reason, that reason alone, I will put this on the stack. But it is in a very high regard stack, for sure. Okay, Ken Joe. I agree with Bill. I'd probably put this in the high stack. I actually love that Batman analogy at the end. Same. Fucking great. And now I have to find, I have to rewatch this movie at one point. But that's also the other reason why I'm putting this in the stack. As I think I probably said before here on the podcast before, I, this is a great movie. I don't understand how they, there's no way to watch this fucking movie for free. It is made in the seventies and I don't understand how you have to pay for movies that were made like several years ago. <laughs> oh, 50. I got two words. Warner Brothers. Oh, uh, you know, that's fair. It's not even, you know what? And what's even weirder is whenever you ask me to do this, I swear it was free on Prime like last week. Might have been. Like, I'm... Yeah, like fucking, fucking goddamn fucking guy who owns fucking Max right now, that asshole. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I like this movie a lot. I thought it was pretty good. And, uh, part of me kind of wants to figure out what, like, the order for the next ones are. But, I don't know. Ken's got to confirm if they're good or not. I really, you know, <laughs> wouldn't know. <laughs> I remember the second one being good, but then again, this was a long, long time ago, and that mic and this mic are two completely different people. Mm -hmm. So, I can't judge my taste in that. All right, and I'll, I'll go last. I'm putting this in the stack also. I, I had a good time. I enjoyed this movie, and after talking with you guys, you made it even better. So, still going to go in the stack, but I'm glad that we watched it, even though it just was strange that this ended up in the podcast, but I'm glad it did. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes you need a couple strange things. Because I never would have, I never would have picked this. Never would have put it on the Patreon poll. Never would have did it. Nothing had it not been for Ken's Ken's D poll. Yep, my idiot poll. And to be fair, all of those movies on that poll would have been great episodes. Every I single one. Don't know what most of those movies. I can't remember if I recognized all those movies that you had on there. What was on the? I don't remember the poll. Uh, Dirty uh, Harry, Tales from the Crypt presents Demon Knight, Dracula Dead and Loving It, and The Departed. Um, yeah, those would all have been a lot of fun. Yeah, agree. Agreed. That would have been a solid lineup, regardless of what won. But I'm glad Dirty Harry won because now I can say I saw it. <laughs> and Bill, where can people find you at? Um, I can be found at a Gamer Looks at Forty podcast. It's a podcast that tells allows people to tell the stories of the video games, franchises, and series that affected them. And it's a big old nostalgia fest, like sitting around the campfire. Talking about old day, the old days of video games. It's kind of the vibe I go for. I'm right now in the middle of a Final Fantasy series, and within that series, a mini series on Final Fantasy VI. I'm not sure when this is releasing, but 
I'm sure I will still be in Final Next Fantasy week. mode. Next week, I will be in Final Fantasy mode. So if you dig that series, I am the podcast to listen to. Damn it. Other than this one, of course. Listen to this one first. <laughs> then listen to mine. And then whatever else the other, these other fine gentlemen are doing. Uh, yeah, a gamer looks at 440.com is where all my everything is. And I'm available on every pod player known to human and alien kind. If everything goes right, this should be dropping on 725. As long as I can edit within a week, which I should be just fine. And Ken, did you have something to plug? Nope. Okay. Oh, wait. You know what? No, I did. I know. This movie actually was the revival to my movie blog that I haven't written on in four years, uh, located at kennethsanity.wordpress.com. The blog post about uh, this movie, uh, 1,100 words about Dirty Harry and Dark Knight. Uh, We'll be going live on July 25th, the same day as this episode gets released. So if you want to go check it out, by all means, check it out. Like I said, I haven't written a lot, but what I have on there is interesting. You look into the mind, (laughs) a look into the mind of the great Ken Sanity. It is not the first big reach I've made. (laughs) (laughs) I can can believe that. And if you enjoyed this episode, over 650 other episodes of the podcast, you can see everything we've done on Podbean. We're also on probably every freaking podcast or dudes, like he said. If you want to support the show, we do a Patreon. Little dog, you can vote in our Patreon polls. You will see a link in the show notes to that. So if we go support the show, that's how this happened. I do one to two polls a month. And sometimes you get video episodes here and there when it when I feel like it. <laughs> so definitely go check out all that. We have Discord. Please join Discord free. I always have having new people join us, chat with us. Uh, we're going to shout out my awesome intro and outro. Crazy Helena at Hell Has Fury. Follow her on TikTok, Twitch, Instagram. You see a link to her link tree in the show notes. And please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, TikTok sometimes, and youtube audio only but we can be on all those other things i think that's everything i need to say so we will see you guys all next time bye everybody so long took the words right i'm out see ya punk <laughs>